Hey guys, this is Mr. Arvitus back with another coronavirus history lesson. This is AP World History, and today we're going to talk about World War I, specifically the start of World War I. This is one of my favorite lessons to do. It's one that I think allows us to go into a little bit of depth, and it's one that you don't always get in every class. So strap yourselves in. This is the start of World War I. Now, a lot of people will look to the year the war actually started, which is 1914. And that would be an easy starting point, okay? But it's not the correct one. Yes, the assassination of Francis Ferdinand does spiral Europe into the First World War. However, the real reasons are much deeper than that, and you have to go further back. Now, some people would say, hey, we could go into the early 1900s, right? And we could get into the alliance system, or we could get into the 1880s, right, where we get into imperialism. But really, the starting point I like to look at is going to be a very important year, and that is 1871, okay? 1871 is immensely important. Uh, and the reason for that is that is the end of the Franco-Prussian War, okay? The Franco-Prussian War, which we learned about with the Bismarck section, is when Germany unified by going to war with France. And so all the German city-states go to war with France, they win the Franco-Prussian War in eight months, and they unify under one flag, creating the German Empire under, under Kaiser Wilhelm. Now, 1871 for France, France is a disaster, right? Their military is embarrassed. They lost a huge war. And all of a sudden, they're now picking up the pieces. And so that's going to cause a ripple effect into Europe. Now, there's one other factor I think we need, to, we need to put in there before we really start to get into all of this. And that, of course, is the Ottoman Empire. Okay, now the Ottoman Empire, which not everybody talks about this enough, in the 1800s begins to lose territory everywhere, right? They lose Greece. They lose a lot of territory in Europe. So the fallout of the Ottoman Empire losing territory in Europe, specifically in the Balkans, is going to be one of the big things that causes the First World War. Why is that? Because there's two countries, right? Russia and Austria. And they are competing for that Balkans area. And Austria wants to kind of conquer these areas. Russia wants to manipulate them uh, as controlling powers. But both of them are trying to use these areas for their control. And so because of that, that's really where this war is going to kind of start. And that's why they can't really negotiate peace settlements. So let's move forward, right? So 1871, after the French lose the war, right? After the French lose the war, they have to redo everything, right? They redo their government. They get a, they get a, a constitution, the fifth constitution that they've had since the revolution. And ultimately, they're going to start to remilitarize. Now, France is going to start to look for allies. Now, they don't have that many allies, okay? Because France, if you recall, is one of the major powers in the world. And so they don't always have the allies that they need to do these things. So we have France on this side, right? And we now have Germany over here. So we got France and Germany, right? These two competing powers, right? De definitely, uh, de definitely not liking each other, okay? Now France looks to Britain, but Britain does not like France that much. Remember, historical rivalries. And quite frankly, after 1871, Britain is kind of in a wait and see. They're expanding their empire all across the world. And really, their kind of policy in the 1800s is we don't need an alliance. We're the British Empire. Our navy will defend us. Our empire will defend us. And so Great Britain's going to kind of stay out of this. Now, Germany is fast at work, too, right? They're going to immediately create an alliance with Austria. Now, Austria, because they are German, right, German-speaking peoples, that is a natural alliance. And so the Germans are going to kind of get with the Austrians here, right, Austria-Hungary. Now, Austria-Hungary, right, and Germany, two unified countries, right, uh, together. They also had Russia in on that in the early 1870s. Now, that won't last very long because of the Balkans. The Balkans are ultimately going to be that area that kind of pulls a lot of these things apart. The Balkans are in Eastern Europe, right, just north of Greece in the Balkan Peninsula, and the Ottoman Empire has basically moved out of town, okay? And so now all these places are up for grabs. And one of the places that was really up for grabs is a place called Bosnia. Now, Bosnia, Bosnia is going to be conquered and taken over by Austria-Hungary, okay? So they're going to take over that. The Russians didn't really like that. And so in the 1880s and 1890s, as Russia begins to really dislike the Austrians, who they already hated to begin with, uh, the Russians begin to look to France. And France looks to Russia because Russia is on the other side of Germany. Remember, this is prior to the creation of Poland. Poland is, belongs to Germany, Austria, and Russia. So Russia creates a nice front on the east side of Germany for the French. And so they're going to look to the Russians and they're going to form an alliance. Now this is kind of crazy because remember, France, France is a democracy. Russia is authoritarian, right? You have the czars, very, very poor human rights and everything else. Still have serfdom in some parts of Russia at this point in time. And so the Russians and the French are going to make an alliance. Now this alliance, this alliance that they make is really important because it's economic too. What the French do is they invest large sums of money, large, large sums of money 
into Russia. And in fact, one fourth of everything in Russia, all the businesses are going to be funded by the French at this point in time. And that's going to create this massive alliance. And by the 1880s, 1887, and then we get to 1890s, this alliance also becomes a military alliance. Okay. And the thought process behind these alliances were that if you were that big, no country would go to war with you. Now, Bismarck, who was still in charge in Germany, or at least will be for a little bit, uh, had a view on these alliances. He said the world is run by five major powers, five major powers, right? That's Great Britain, France, Russia, Germany, and Austria. And he said, as long as you're in the alliance of three, you're good. They're not going to be in the alliance of three. And that's why World War I ultimately is going to end the way it does. But France and Russia here forming this alliance was kind of a big deal. That caused Germany and Austria to solidify their alliance and make it more military based. Okay, Now, Germany and Austria are going to be investing large sums of money in each other and everything else. But it's going to be militarily based now. So if you get attacked, Austria, Germany will come to your defense. France, if you get attacked, Russia will come to your defense and vice versa. Okay, Now, so these alliances become very complex throughout the 1890s into 1900. And they become complex because of a couple of factors. One is going to be Great Britain, okay? Now, Great Britain, for, for those of you who don't know, right? Great Britain's trying to make sure that they are independent of a lot of this stuff. And so Great Britain isn't going to join this right away. But what Great Britain does have, what they do have, is an alliance to protect the country of Belgium. Um, and you're like, well, why would they protect Belgium? Why would they have that alliance? Because Belgium had been taken over in the Franco-Prussian War. It had been marched through in the Napoleonic Wars. It was kind of this country that was always in between these warring states. And so Britain said, we'll protect Belgium and we'll build them up via trade. They also had a similar type deal with the Netherlands. And that's going to be really, really important in the start of the war because it's really one of the major factors that gets Britain involved. Well, as we progress, right, uh, Germany is actually going to find a new partner. And that is going to be Italy. They find the Italians as a new partner, and the Italians, who are this emerging power, or at least in their minds they are, are, are going to have an alliance with the Austrians and the Germans. Now, the alliance the Italians had is a little looser, right? The Austrians and Germans is really firm, kind of like solidified. If we go to war, we go to war together. The Italians is basically based off of if they are attacked, right? And specifically, if France declares war, they will help out the Germans and the Austrians. And so Italy kind of has an alliance, but is very uneasy with it. And we'll see a similar position by Britain. So as, as the century ends and we get into the 20th century, Great Britain is going to join this France-Russian alliance, and they're going to form the Triple Entente, right? Now, why do they do that? Well, Great Britain has been watching Germany, okay? They've been watching the Germans, and they're saying, wait a second, you guys are expanding overseas to all these African colonies, and then specifically, when Wilhelm II takes power, Right? When Wilhelm II takes power, he begins to invest heavily in Germany's navy and begins to produce large amounts of battleships to specifically compete with the British Empire. He even has a number of public statements where in an interview he says, the British are our enemy overseas. We have to compete with them and be better than them in everything. And this creates an arms race between the British and the Germans navally. Because of that, Great Britain is going to break its long-standing policy of having zero alliances with major powers. It'll also break its long-standing policy of having no alliances with France in particular, and they will then join the Triple Entente, or form the Triple Entente, if you will. Now, for Great Britain, it's the same thing as Italy. It's basically an alliance that says, if you're attacked, we'll protect you. So the British are now logged in, right? Triple Entente. And then we have the Triple Alliance over here with Italy, Austria, Hungary, and Germany. So now we are poised for a conflict. And where's it all going to start? It's going to start in Bosnia. Now, before we get to Bosnia, we have to understand there's a little bit more to it. There's a country called Serbia. Serbia is a newly independent country. And that independent country uh, came from the Ottoman Empire. And they have kind of run into trouble with Austria, Hungary numerous times. And so Serbia actually had an alliance with the Russians. The Russians had pledged to protect the Slavic peoples, including the Serbs. And so the Russians have an alliance with Serbia to protect them against any war, specifically a war with Austria. And so now we kind of have all of our pieces to the puzzle coming forward, okay? And this is going to get way, way, way more complex in a little bit. Now, as all of this starts to go on, we have a series of events in Bosnia in the early 20th century, 1908, 19, uh, 1912, and then eventually 1914. Uh, these are small revolts that are put down by the Austria-Hungarians uh, in that area. Russia advocates for a free Bosnia. Serbia wants a free Bosnia, okay? Well, Austria does not. Uh, now, the crown prince of Austria is a guy named Francis Ferdinand. Uh, Francis Ferdinand, who is one of these guys, and we'll, we'll draw his little picture on here. I am a, a, an outstanding artist, right? And there he is. He's got his little, little crown. Francis Ferdinand and his wife, Sophia. 
Sophia is uh, a commoner wife, which made her kind of interesting, right? Not a noble. Um, and they're going to go visit Bosnia, specifically the city of Sarajevo in 1914. This is a really bad idea because this was the anniversary of Bosnian independence. And so when they're visiting there, there's already a lot of just hype, okay? And so they're going to go visit there. Now, a lot of people suspect that Francis Ferdinand might be plotting to give the Bosnians, in particular any type of, of Slav, rights in Austria-Hungary. Give them voting rights, give them their own parliament. And that's one of the things that we know that he was actually thinking about doing once he took the crown. That made him sort of unpopular in parts of Austria, most specifically unpopular in Hungary. But either way, that's why they're there. They're in Sarajevo. Now, a bomb goes off right next to their car as they're parading through in a convertible. And you would think when the bomb goes off, you just go to shelter and you don't come back out. No, not these guys, okay? Because they're royalty and they, they feel like they can't be hurt. Well, they're going to go back out and it's going to be a small little incident that kind of does this. And it's going to be a guy named Gavril Princip. Gavril Princip. Uh, Princip is 19 years old and he is going to shoot, right? Francis Ferdinand and Sophia. And so with two bullets, he is going to assassinate, he's going to assassinate the crown prince princess of Austria-Hungary. And they're going to die there. Now, Princip is going to be arrested by the Austrians. He is going to be arrested, right? They're going to arrest him. And Princip is going to be linked back to an organization. This organization is going to be known as the Black Hand. So that organization is known as the Black Hand. Now this sounds like something out of like a James Bond movie or something, but it couldn't be more real. Princip belongs to this terrorist group called the Black Hand. The Black Hand's sole purpose was to create a free Bosnia. Now, as the Austrians start digging deeper, it goes into various conspiracies. And those conspiracies all centered around Serbia. Okay, and, the, and, and they were actually tied to some reality. There were members of the Serbian government, particularly the Serbian military, that had funded the Black Hand. And that came out as they began to torture and interview various peoples in the Black Hand. That Serbia had been funding this terrorist organization that assassinated the crown prince and princess of Austria-Hungary. And there we go, right? We're now in, in, in some, some deep water, okay? Now, this should probably have not have caused a global war. But it will, largely because of people being romanticized, visions of honor, huge nationalism, not wanting to back down politically, but this is how it's gonna spin out of control. Now, as Serbia starts to get blamed for this, Austria is now going to contact Serbia, and they are going to basically berate them, okay? Uh, they also contact the Germans, and the Germans are gonna make it very well known, hey, look, Austria, if you wanna do this, we got your back, okay? We're talking June, July, one month is, is how all of this is gonna kind of break down. And so the Germans say, hey, Austria, we got your back. Now, Serbia is kind of freaking out, so they contact the Russians, and the Russians are like, look, Serbia, if anything happens, we got your back too. Now, what's going to end up going on, though, is Austria-Hungary is going to give Serbia an ultimatum. Now, this ultimatum had a whole bunch of different uh, things to it. Some of it was financial compensation. Some of it was a, a secession of territory, uh, a reduction of the Serbian military. But the big part of it that they wanted to do was a purging of the Serbian military officials that the Austrians believed were in the black hand. And it, and it was way more than actually were. It was like half of Serbia's military hierarchy would have been purged in this. Now, Serbia actually, for their part, is agreeing to some of these things, but they don't agree to some territorial exchanges, they don't agree to some financial compensation, and they definitely don't agree to a complete purging on Austria's terms of their military. And so, you know, Austria-Hungary kind of gives them this ultimatum and says, look, you have until X day in July to do this. And Serbia is then contacting Russia, who's then like, look, you don't got to do this, we got your back. Germany publicly is going to give Austria what we call a blank check. Uh, the blank check is a metaphor. It's not an actual literal check, so don't think it's, this is like a sweepstakes where they hand out a check. But they give Austria a blank check. That blank check is going to be representative of saying, hey, look, we will, we will help you no matter what. It's your right to do it. Cash the check we're in. And Austria at that point in time has all they need to do this. Now, we also have Britain coming in and saying, look, guys, everybody calm down. We just need to be you know, peaceful with each other. We can still trade with one another. We can continue down this road. But everyone's kind of upset with Britain at this point and says, look, we're, this is happening. Okay. Now, as Serbia refuses, as Serbia refuses to, to go through with this, uh, Austria-Hungary is then going to declare war on Serbia. Uh, as war is declared on Serbia, due to this alliance, boom, 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 right? We get to the Russians. The Russians are then going to declare war on Austria-Hungary. Germany, in response to that, 
He is going to declare war on both Serbia and then on Russia. And before France can even declare war on Germany, Germany is also declaring war on France and France vice versa. France will also declare war on Austria-Hungary. And so, boom, we have all the alliances coming into play now, right? So we have it all coming into play. Except Great Britain at this point is like, look, guys, everybody calm down. And they're going to have some last-ditch peace efforts, right? And, and, and the great phrase by the British foreign minister was that the, the lanterns are going out all over Europe, and I do not know when they will be lit again. And that is a very ominous thing because a lot of these countries, France thinks this war is going to be over in months. Their, their military has been planning a war with Germany for years. And in fact, the newest plans came out in 1912. They're, you know, they're, they're really good. The Germans have been planning for a war with France. Same thing. Their newest war plans, the Schleifen plan, which we'll talk about in a minute, come out in 1908, you know, 1910. Okay? And so all these countries are starting to go to war with each other. Now, Italy at this point is like, look. Germany, Austria, I think you guys are the aggressors here. And so we don't want to fight. And so Italy's like, sorry, guys, we're out. And so Italy backs out of that alliance. And so now it's just Germany and Austria versus France and Russia and Serbia. And this seems like it could work, except for the Germans' plan. And when the Germans do invade at the first week of August, you know, they're going to mobilize more than a million soldiers. They have the largest army, 2.1 million soldiers at the start of the war that they could call up. That's larger than almost every other army in the war. Uh, and in fact, the Russians, who did have a lot of soldiers, but not a lot of trained soldiers, are, are sort of equal, but not even close technologically. Well, the Germans, when they invade, are going to do what's called the Schleifen Plan. The Schleifen Plan uh, was, was basically a gamble. And they believed Russia would take months to mobilize soldiers. They thought France was the big enemy. So you attack France first, and then you go to Russia. Now, as part of that plan, they would fake up the middle. So France and Germany are bordered, and they would fake on the middle of that, of that border. And so they would actually attack from the north. And so if we look at my lovely map here, right... We've got Germany right here. So they fake an invasion here. And that's where the French think they're going to attack. And the French will actually stack a lot of soldiers. But the Germans' real attack is going to come through the Netherlands and then Belgium. And this is the exact same way they attack in the Franco-Prussian War. It's also the same way they're going to attack in World War II. So it's something of a very common plan. And their goal is to get to Paris. They believe they can get to Paris in a couple of months and the war's over. And then they just railroad people off to Russia. Now, some of the... That was loud. So, so some of, the, uh, so, so some of the, the countermeasures France has done is they changed the gauge of railroad tracks so that the Germans can't use their railroad exclusively. They would have to you know, disembark once they got into France. Um, now, the, Fran now, the Germans, the big problem with this invasion is that they go through, they go through Belgium. Okay, And so when Germany does invade, they're going to declare war on Belgium because Belgium does not let their troops go through it. And once they go to war with Belgium, Great Britain's going to give them 48 hours. Remove your soldiers or we go to war. And Germany at this point says, we don't care. We're going through Belgium to get to France. And Britain is then going to say, fine, you made us do this. And so Great Britain will then declare war on Germany, which causes Austria to declare war back on, on Great Britain. And so now we have Germany going through Belgium to France, okay? Now, this plan of Germany's might have worked, okay? This plan of Germany's might have worked, except for two big factors, okay? The Germans did not account for the British being able to mobilize a couple hundred thousand soldiers to the front. That was a big miscal miscalculation. The other is the Russians. So about two and a half weeks into the invasion, the French army, the Belgian army, the British army are in massive retreats. But the Russians attack on the German border and defeat a couple, of, a couple of army groups. And so now the decision has to be made by the German high command. Do we possibly lose territory to Russia, even sacrificing Berlin to get to Paris and then try and fight back? Or do we stall this for a couple of weeks, put soldiers back on the Russian front uh, and, and go from it from there? They decide to stall for a couple of weeks. They're going to go there. They're 35 miles, 40 miles away from Paris at the beginning of this. And so they're going to stall. They're going to go back. They're going to go to the Russians, and they're going to attack them. Now, as this is all going on, there's also going to be fighting in all of the colonies, okay? Uh, and, and so that's something that's really kind of important to understand, that they do have fighting in other places. Now, as 1914 grinds to a halt, it's going to grind to a halt because when the Germans come back for the offensive along the Meuse, uh, the British are there, the French are there, they're dug in in trenches, and now all of a sudden it's going to be technology versus tactics. There are no tactics to defeat the technology yet. We need to have more technology to do that. And so, quite frankly, they stall into trench warfare. Now, how does everybody else get involved? Well, that, that's a whole other story altogether. Uh, as we get into 1915, the Germans are going to reach out to the Ottoman Empire. Now, the Ottoman Empire had been losing territory uh, repeatedly during the 1800s, and this is their point. They 
dislike the Russians tremendously. They dislike the British. And so the Ottomans are going to form in that alliance, and they're going to form the central powers, right? They're going to form the central powers here with Austria-Hungary and Germany. And so the Ottoman Empire joins up, and they're going to declare war specifically on Great Britain because they're going to try and get some territory back from them, and specifically on Russia, which causes France to declare war back on the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and now the Ottomans present uh, some interesting problems for the British, right? Because if they could take Egypt, that'll take away the Suez Canal. And so the British are going to fight with the Ottomans over that. They're also going to try a series of invasions uh, in Turkey, which we know as Winston Churchill uh, famously ordered one that failed Gallipoli, right? And so that's how the Ottomans get into it. Now, the Italians are going to get in because they want territory from Austria. And so Britain is going to be the negotiator on this, and they're going to get Italy to join their alliance and declare war on Austria-Hungary, which is going to cause, of course, Germany to declare war back and the Ottomans to declare war back. And so they're going to declare war on them, and that becomes you know, how Italy gets involved. Okay. And now there's some other smaller countries that get in there. You could talk about Greece. Greece gets involved to steal territory from the Ottomans and to steal territory from the Austrians. Um, but ultimately, you, know, you talk about like when does the U.S. get involved? The U.S. does not get involved in this war until 1917. Okay, originally the U.S. is trying to trade kind of with both sides. We traded a lot with Germany at the time, traded a lot with Britain at the time, uh, but we're trying to stay kind of neutral. Uh, but as it goes on, right, German U-boats were sinking our ships in 1915, 1916. We're getting very agitated. The British cut the, the transatlantic cable, which cut off all communication from mainland Europe to the United States. And so the only news of the war we get is from the British. And it's all about atrocities taking place in Belgium and northern France. And so by 1917, the United States is kind of spinning in this pro-war momentum, okay? And then it's really going to take a couple of different events. One, the Russians are going to lose in 1917. Uh, the Russians, remember, they got out of, out of the, the Russo-Japanese War just a decade before and lost. And so now the Russians are going to lose a large-scale war. Uh, they're going to have a revolt in the middle of their country in 1917. And so by the end of 1917, the Russians are out of the war. The United States will join right after the Russians are out. And that's because now it's democracy, right, versus dictatorship, or at least in our minds it is. And so in 1917, the United States joins largely because our, our ships are getting attacked by U-boats. We have the Zimmerman note where the Germans are promising Mexico aid if they help attack the United States. Uh, and then we also have Russia getting out of it. So absolutism is out of the triple entente. And so the U.S. will, will be involved. If you want to know about U.S. involvement, you know, you could simply just look no further. U.S. soldiers really start to, to funnel in at the end of 1917, really 1918. We're only in it for the last 10 months of fighting. So that's the start of World War I. I hope you enjoyed this lesson. Again, one of my favorites. And if you're looking at all these lines on the board, I actually cut it down a little bit. But it should be pretty easy to pick up. So until next time, Mr. Arvidas.